All right, this is Andrea York, and I'm with Catch the Fire Worship Flags, and you're watching Fire Catchers Classroom, the on display. We're talking about identity today. It's, it's September 15th, 2018, and uh, this is a monthly event that we, we do in our Fire Catchers online Facebook group, um, and so I welcome we have a few people that are joining us live and then we'll also be recording this and replaying this so that it can be listened to later uh, this is in it, as i was just kind of saying to the group before we started recording this is identity we're going to be talking about identity identity is one of my i would say lifelong pursuits uh, to to know myself uh, to know god and to uh, help others know who they are in Christ. So I am going to open in prayer uh, and then we're going to start with the teaching. So Father, I think that you've created us so wonderfully, so beautifully, and so uniquely. I pray that the this morning as we spend an hour together, that your words would, would come through um, what you've taught me. And as I teach it to uh, to the fire catchers, uh, that we will really grasp and get a hold of our identity and who we are and what we're created to do. And so uh, we just give this time to you. Um, we focus, we love each other, and we love you. Amen. All right, so the, it, it, the theme here is the identity beyond display. Who, and really we're going to be asking, answering the question, who are you anyway? That you are created by God, for God, and in God, so that you are the picture of God in a world that needs God. So that's kind of what we're, we're going to be talking about, and this theme keeps coming up and up and up um, as, as I've been immersed in, in identity. At every stage in life, you have to answer the question, who are you? It, you know, in the last collection of worship flags that I had released was the names of God. And what we asked then was, who do I need God to be for me today? Um, who do I need God to be for me this week, this month, this year? And we, I, we discovered God's identity through his names. Now, our focus this time is about who has God made you to be? Um, who you are, and what are you supposed to do. So our proper identity, when we know our proper identity, who heaven says you are, who God says you are, it gives us confidence to be and do what God has designed us for, our purpose. Um, and then it allows us to be on display without being arrogant about who we are. It's confidence in who we are, not arrogance in who we are. And it really was something that God had said to me, I, I've, I've got a lot of, I'm going to weave in a lot of my own personal testimonies and stuff and things that have happened because I think that they're relevant for you because uh, as I've shared this with this with other people before, uh, I get I, I get confirmation. Oh yeah, that's me. That's me. They understand. And I remember I, I was in a season where I was moving into something brand new, and I I had said I was just going to sit back and and relax and take it in and not be not be jumping up, not be the mouthpiece not be a mouthy piece. Um, and and it, it didn't take long before, before I, I, I kind of fell into really who, 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 who my personality is. And I'm like, oh Lord, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like I just, I, this, is not, this is not who I want to be. I want to be who you want me to be. And the Lord said to me, I didn't make you to be a wallflower. Like I wasn't intended to be sitting at the back. And so that was, that was a quote that I had, but like, I know that that's true for, for everyone. And, and it just really, really resonated with people as I would, would share this story it really resonated. And the idea is that we have a false humility. There's a false humility about our identity. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not that good or 
you know, you know, oh, oh, when you worship, when you worship and you are on display, come on. Flags are the most visual thing that you can possibly do. How can you possibly think that you're going to be, oh, hiding in the back? And the very nature of the flags and the color, it just it's impossible for you to do that. So it is falsely humble to say, it's not about me, it's about God. God says, you are my daughter and I'm putting you on display. And I had this actually with, with Rosie's not here. One of the things that Rosie, uh, when I met Rosie about five years ago, I've shared a little bit of my testimony in the past before, but what she had said, what she did for me was actually put me on display and it propelled me into this public arena of, of worshiping. I had gone through an entire season of work of worshiping the Lord in private. Nobody's around. No, I would go to the church where I was going and I would worship Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I would worship four days a week, probably an hour to two hours at a time before anybody got to the church. And it was just this incredibly beautiful, intimate time. And then when I met Rosie, she went to a church and she had asked me, it was my very first time meeting her. She asked me if I would like to do something at the church. They were do a, a, a performance, like to worship in front of people. And I had not worshiped in front of anybody. And I was very, very hesitant to, to say yes, because I mean, my personality is such that if there's a microphone, I'm the one to grab it. Like that, that is where I will go. I'm, I, it's not that I'm not nervous in front of people, but I'm very comfortable. I'm very comfortable with that kind of nerves. And I, and, um, I always have an opinion about everything and I will share it with anybody. And the, and, but so I was really hesitant because this was such a personal thing and I didn't want to make it about myself. And, the, and God said to me, I am putting you on display. I want others to see what I see. And so that is, I mean, that was five years ago. My, my search for identity definitely happened a lot sooner, like lot, much before that. But it's been in this, this journey of, well, who am I? And can I be huffed up and, and, and pumped up in my pride if God wants to put me on display? Like, who am I to say, no. Who am I to say? Who are you to say no? And if you're, if he's calling you into flag worship, hello, you're on display. And so I think that having a proper understanding of who we are, uh, it takes away the arrogance and it returns to us the confidence that we're supposed to have. And I, and not only are we supposed to be on display and we're supposed to who are we? But when we know who we are, then we know what to do. So it's, so if we are created, um, by God in God and for God, so that we are the picture of God to a world that needs God, there's a, there's a, a journey and there is a place for us to do something. We are supposed to do something. And I want to kind of talk, first, I was actually going to talk actually only about the like part three of what I've actually prepared this morning. And I really feel like the Lord was saying this week, no, we need to go back uh, to, to the beginning a little bit. And I, this is for, this is perhaps for someone here that's watching this morning, one of you guys, or it's going to be for someone who's going to be watching later. But to know that we are actually supposed to to do something that is all for a purpose. Um, and I think that there in this season, there's a lot of teaching and I know it's a little bit contrary and it might feel like I just want to be in the presence. And I talk about being in the presence and being intimate and, and, but quite honestly, intimacy is supposed to lead to fruit. There's supposed to be something that's happening that, that you don't just, I mean, you, <laughs> when you ha are married and you have, you're, you're supposed to, he says, be fruitful and multiply. We're supposed to be replicating ourselves and not rec, replicate. So we're going to talk about that. That seems like a very, when you think about that, that statement, replicating ourselves, what does that mean? And how does God want us to do that? And, and really, do we have the right to say that? And I'm going to, I hope, uh, teach you that to say, yes, we actually have, we are supposed to replicate ourselves. 
because Christ in us, okay? It comes down to the Christ in us and we replicate ourselves that way. Um, so we're supposed to be doing something. We're supposed to be making disciples of all nations. And so how do we do that if we don't do, if, we, if we're if we only in the presence? And so I think this is a def, I, I just feel really strongly that, and I, ha I have some uh, friends that are very great about, uh, they connect to God. They are so close to God. And you're like, wow, I just wish I had that kind of relationship. And they pray all the time and they're just immersed in the presence. And then, but then kind of with those kind of people, they, you think that they're so heavenly minded, minded, they're not, they're no earthly good. Have you heard? Not if you've heard that, that statement, you're so heavenly minded that you ha have no earthly good. And that, what's the purpose of that? <laughs> We are actually supposed to do something here. He wants us to do something here. And I think that we actually even hide behind the staying in that secret place and not coming out. David in scripture was one of the most, had one of the most vivid, intimate relationships with the father, but he was a warrior and he would go out and fight. He'd, he'd go out and fight and then he'd come back and to the, to the, the bosom of the Lord, and then he'd go out and fight again, and then he'd do, you know, he kept coming back, like you have to keep coming back to that place, but you don't stay there. So when you're a child, great, you live at home, Carianna, you have small children, Katie, Samuel's small, um, like my, my son is now 17, and so he's not so small, he's getting to be uh, a lot bigger, but, but and so it's okay for him to still live at home and it's still okay for him to be trying things, but he should be more, be more independent as a parent. That's my goal is for him not to have to ask me, not to tell, have to tell me, mommy, I have to go to the bathroom. Well, no, you can just go to the bathroom. You don't have to, to tell me that that's what you need. You, I've raised you to do that. And, you know, I mean, that's just a silly example, but, Honestly, we, we, do, we do that with the Lord. I, I know someone who is almost probably actually in her 70s. I don't know. And she doesn't make a move without, without, without God. And I think she's like, not that we don't make a move without God. Don't hear, hear this. He's given us a mind to be able to, to function, to be independent of, to understand that we actually have the mind of Christ so that we can move forward into our decisions. We don't need to be so, so incompetent of being able to move forward, of being able to make decisions. He wants us to make decisions because how can he tr entrust the family business, which is destroying the works of the enemy to us if we can't, if we need, can't make um, any decisions or under, not even make understanding our role and our confidence, our identity, that we can make these decisions. And so, it, am I making sense here? Like, I feel like I'm, I hope I'm communicating. So it's, it's cute. It's cute when, you know, Samuel's at home and he is, he needs your help and you're raising him. Max is now 17. I'm raising him to hopefully be on his own. There's a train that's coming. So hopefully it's going to be quick. Um, but you know, if you have a 30 year old or a 40 year old living at home, it's no longer cute. The goal is not to stay where you are. The goal is to actually be confident in who you are so that you know what to do. He wants us to know what to do. Daniel um, 3, eight to 30, we, talk, we hear about the friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they, uh, they had been living kind of in Daniel's shadow. Up until this point, they are only mentioned in relation to Daniel. That Daniel um, obviously was a, a very exceptional and And when they came into their own in, in Daniel chapter 3, hey, Julie, I'm just going to mute you. Um, they, that uh, they came into their own and when they came into their own you see actually 
the choices that they made that they are very strong. And I don't know if they didn't have such a friend like Daniel um, at the beginning. Do you think because, do you think that they would have been um, resolved not to defile themselves in the way that Daniel was obviously the leader of that little friend group? Then when he, then when they were in a position to, to reject the king's command to worship and be at the threat of being thrown into the furnace, they were able to stand together and, and stand up and Daniel's not even mentioned in that portion. I find that, I just find that that's an interesting, it's an interesting portion of scripture. And then they're not mentioned again, actually, after that. And, and it's just, it's the ability of knowing who you are, understanding knowing who you are is then you know what to do. And really, we have a fascination of, of identity. And I think our identity is being attacked in this, in this age. I shared on the weekly uh, when I was ta talking you about what we'd be talking about that my son is he's in his 12th grade and he has moved from a private Christian school for the past five years into a public school and this was such a huge change and it's super scary it is so super scary for me uh, and I, I tried to do everything I could to not make that happen uh, there's just some other circumstances that, that it, God is clearly in it. I'm just very afraid. And um, I keep asking the Lord or testing, like, maybe there's another option and keep trying something else that nothing was happening. But so <laughs> I'm trusting because I have no other choice. But um, at, when we were doing the, the, when we were doing the tour of the school prior to school opening, the very, the very thing that we both were very that were, was so obvious about was the gender bathrooms, that it was a gender neutral bathroom. Oh, well, for crying out loud, it's just a single toilet. Like it, it's, it can be, it can be for your dog. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Anything, you can put your, you can put the kitty litter in there and it's just the bathroom. It doesn't need to be, we have to define that we're not defined. Like, but, but God actually wants to define us because if we don't, if we're not defined, we don't know what to do. And so, and then on the first day of class, they, they were actually asked, do you identify as male, female, or other? I mean, Canada is the very first country that we put on our birth certificates now that was ruled actually last year, that you can have an X in terms, in the place of male or female. You don't have to identify that they, you can be an X. And so with the rise of Ancestry.com, like I was looking at um, Ancestry.com, that's the website where you can you can research and look for your previous ancestors and it gives you kind of a, an overview of who you are that that company is um at of last year 2017 had made 850 million dollars a lot of people want to know who we are with the rise of the tv show so who do you think you are anyway uh it's been going for 10 years I didn't even realize that it was 10 years that we've been intrigued with who we are. Okay, and so there is a cost to knowing who, if you don't know who you are. Um, so every errant behavior is a result of not understanding your proper identity. Every errant behavior is a result of not understanding your proper identity. The cost is being unstable and double-minded. Uh, James... James 1 talks about this, that, that if we don't, it's like, who forgets who they are? Who, who looks in the mirror intently and then goes away and forgets who they are? And if you do, you, you are unstable. And actually, James says, don't expect that you're going to get anything from God. That is a person without faith. To have faith to know this is, this is the substance of what I stand on, which is Christ. It's all Christ. We're not, um, we're not apart from Christ in any way. And if um, I, I want to keep coming back to that, but I'm making really bold claims here. That it is the Christ in us and trusting that Christ is in us. Trusting that we're, that we're following and, and being confident of this. This is what I'm confident of that Paul says. So your prayers and your testimony, if it lacks confidence, you lack faith. And who 
if you do not know who you are, how can you lead others into who you are, into who they are? You cannot. It, I, I mean, I do a lot of, uh, you know, the, I, the idea of sales is selling someone on, on your methodology. And we are all salespeople. Moms are salespeople for their children, trying to, <laughs> trying to sell your kids on eating vegetables, sell your kids on why they need to wear clothes, <laughs> sell your kids, you, right? You were all trying to convince, but if you are not confident, can you really, like my girl, my sister, my girlfriend, my sister-in-law, does not like vegetables, never has. She, I think the, the most exotic of all vegetables that she'll eat is broccoli. And so is it really a surprise that her vegetables? Because you can't, if you're not, if you're not that person, if you're not already modeling for them who they are, how can they know who to, how to be? So if we're supposed to be discipling nations and however that looks for you, whatever the influence God has, you have more influence than, than you realize. And there is a job for you. But if you don't do that, if you aren't confident, how can, how can you be fulfilling what God has called you to be? And so, and how can, if you're not, if you're begging God, he doesn't respond to, he doesn't respond to begging. He responds to faith. He responds to faith. All right. So I looked up the def, and def, identity has a, holy cow, we're moving past. Def, identity has a lot of different different definitions or um, points of definition, and I'm, we're just really going to focus on three. One, and I got this off dictionary.com. Uh, qualities or beliefs that distingu distinguish a person. Uh, de no, definition two, the state of remaining the same under varying aspects or conditions. And three, the condition of being oneself and not another. So what I was actually anticipating on that I was going to talk a lot more on, which I probably will talk the, the, the least amount on, is, the number, is number three, the condition of being oneself and not another, because I really feel that um, what God was telling me to do as of this earlier this week was uh, understanding that you, that you have distinguishing qualities that God loves about you. That God loves you for you. And, and so I want to kind of focus on that you are created in God, for God, and by God, so that you're the picture of God in a world that needs God. But we're really going to focus right now on the created in God, for God, and by God. And that you are unique. There is no one on earth that is like you, past, present, or in the future. No one will be you. No one can be you. No one has been you, no one can, can be you, and no one will be you. God loves you for you. He's very pleased with who he made. Okay, and the lie that I think is very pervasive in the church, and this is something that I have really struggled with, is that God wants to transform you into a different person with different personality. So the the um i had a dream so i was in a, i was in a kind of a freedom it's, it was called freedom session but it is like a um a deliverance ministry the whole it's it's a very long um ministry it's it's kind of like it's the doing it's when you have a sozo when you have when you have some deliverance but it's doing the work it's not the it's, it's doing it's walking it out and and practicing it and and understanding with a very strong Bible background basis of who you are and the lies that we've been believing. And, and so it, at, early on to the program, I started to, the teaching was, you know, before Christ, you're this, this, and this. So I was like, <gasps> like, is there anything you like about me, Lord? I, I thought like everything has to change. Like everything, everything was wrong about me. And I, I, I mean, how many times have you been told that you're too much, you're too little, you're too this, you're too that, that you don't fit in, that you be quiet, whatever your instinct is wrong, whatever your instinct is, it's wrong. And quite honestly, in the church, I have felt 
that I have felt more judgment in the church than anywhere else. I am, I've already told you, I, if there's a microphone in the room, I'm going to grab it. That, but, but, I, oh, and you shouldn't have selfish ambition. You shouldn't have ambition. You shouldn't be ambitious. Really, where does it say in the Bible that you shouldn't be ambitious? Actually, Paul talks about, about going after the prize and getting the prize. Well, that talks a lot to me about competi competition and not competition with others, but going after it. And, and so I started, I felt like the, prayer, I've, I've I told you in other previous firecatchers classrooms that prayer, like to go to a prayer meeting is, is very hard for me to just sit there and pray and be lamenting in the prayer and to, and but get me to worship in prayer and to pray over you and dance or in color or, um, and to be expressive. Well, that's my, I, I'm learning that that's okay. But in the past, I, I think there's an awareness coming in um, as we understand who we are. We're telling other people, it's okay to be, I'm, I'm okay with who I am. But coming back and fast forwarding, a little, that was a fast forward, but coming back to, I was just, I was so devastated that, that I thought, was there nothing, nothing that was good about me and that I needed to change. I needed to be more demure. I, I was too loud. I was too this, too that. And then I had a dream. And in my dream, I was coming along my, the road that I, to get to my house. And there's, there's a, a big, beautiful home that I just love. I've always loved it. Ever since we've lived in this house for uh, 15 years, and I, it's this wonderful home that I've loved this house for 15 years. And so I could see on on the road on the drive that the house had been taken over by new owners. And so I was with my husband, and I I stopped. I said, "Hey, Gary, let's let's go in to see the house while it's while it's kind of in transition." while the old owners are not there and the new owners haven't yet moved in, let's take a look because I've, I've only loved that house from afar and I really want to see inside the house. And so I went inside the house and uh, it, it turned out that the new owner was there and I was like, Oh, I'm so sorry about, about, you know, peeking into your house. And uh, he says, no, do you want to, do you want to look around? I'd, I'd love to show you around my house. And, uh, and he said, and I looked and I could see like this big, beautiful house was really beautiful on the outside, but I could see that there had been in the corners, you know how their dirt gets in and it's just kind of grimy things that haven't been really properly cleaned out. And uh, so it was just, it was, there was dirt in it and just grime that had been built up over the years. And I thought, Ooh, Ooh, this, I said, this place, this house is wonderful, but it really needs a power clean. Um, like it just needs the, a power wash. And, um, and then I woke up. So that was, that was the dream. And I felt like the Lord was saying that house um, that I loved was me. I, I really like, I like who I am. I actually really like who God made me to be. And in this process of going to freedom session, I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't like who I am because I need to change everything about it. And, and God is saying, no, I'm taking ownership of this. This is my house. And there's been things that have been neglected. There's been things that have been pushed to the side, that the, the structure of what's there is beautiful and it's grand and it's on display, but we're going to power wash it. We're going to, we're going to wash it with the Holy Spirit, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to, and, we're, and it's going to be, it's going to be as good as new. And that he loves, he loves that. And so and so I, that's to encourage you that your personality is who God made you to be. I am a, a, I'm just a lover of personality tests. And that's one of the things I'm going to provide for you is I, I love, and I'm, I'm kind of like a, I call myself a, an amateur psychology researcher because I love I love to be able to know who I am. I really love being able to know. Um, I look at, I look at when I'm studying people or I'm looking at people, it's not even what they t tell me. I like, I like to see why they do things. What makes you be that? When, when Stephanie Meyer, she was the writer of the Twilight books. I, I, I don't judge me. I read all of them. And, um, but I was really, really, really intrigued by 
why would she write that book? Knowing that she was Mormon, she wrote this book. And I was just like the whole concept of all of these, these, these really lofty ways of understanding God were, were interweaved into those books. And so I was really intrigued by, by who she was and what makes her do those things. And when I, when I meet people, I, I'm, I'm interested to know what makes you do those things because that's kind of who you are. And, and, and it's beautiful. We have just this tapestry of different, of different parts. And so we, we have this errant thinking in the church that when we become, we know that the past is put aside and then we are new creation in Christ. So we're going to, we're going to, this verse will come up um, throughout the teaching this morning, but where we, I think that what well, it's not spoken, but there's this pervasive thought that we are new creation, that we are not, we cease to be individuals in it, that we are, that we all become like each other, like as if God, Jesus, like, so Jesus is all of the personalities. So if I, I, I like the, the Myers-Briggs, those are the number, the letters, E, E, S, T, P, or whatever, those letters. Um, he was all of those personality types, perfectly and redeemed. And so that we are not vanilla, we are not vanilla. We are such a diverse myriad of flavors and colors and personalities, and that got, that's who God wants us to be. And so I did a lot of, uh, been doing a lot of research on it. And so I found this book. I'll actually do, a, it's called Knowing Me, Knowing God, and it's about, it's a kingdom perspective. And I just want to read uh, an excerpt for you. Uh, it, and he... The author is Malcolm Goldsmith. He's, he's actually quoting a different writer, Mark Pearson, um, an Escopalian. Escop Escop Am I saying that right? No. He's a priest. <laughs> For the president. Episcopalian. Yes, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Episcopalian. Episcopalian. When God goes to work making us holier people, he does not destroy the personality we have. He transforms it. The Peter of the Gospels is spiritually immature, but in the Acts of the Apostles, by which time the Holy Spirit had accomplished some spiritual growth in Peter, we don't suddenly see an introvert mystic. We find the same extrovert, plain-spoken man, but with maturity. God didn't give Peter a different personality. God improved the personality he had already given him. Just as your eye color and the shape of your ears are part of how I made you, so is your personality. It is something I gave you. Thus, there's no personality type that is better or worse than another. Any personality type can be used for my glory and can be an expression or can be an expression of rebellion to me. Yes, you've misused it. You've need. You need to come to me for forgiveness, and you need to let the Holy Spirit mature you. Mature you. you need a power wash. You need to be washed and redeemed. So what does, so my personality type is ENTJ, which is very contrary to what the majority of Christians are. The majority of Christians are, are Fs at the, so uh, e, EI would be extrovert, introvert. That's not shy or or bold. It's, it's how you are, you recharge. I recharge in a group of people as opposed to by myself. The S and the T, the S and the E and the S and the N it's sensing or intuitive. So intuitive would probably be forward thinking a little bit more visionary and an uh, S would be sensing. So it's how you respond to your environment, the here, what, where, when, why, um, the five senses, what's, what's real right now versus what could be real. Uh, so those are the two differences, the T and the F. The T is the thinker, the analytical person, and the F is the feeler, the one who is how, do, and you, you can actually know, this is probably the easiest way to know people, what, they, what their bent is towards when you say, I think this, I think, I think the time is going to, or I, I think it's time for us to talk about something else, or I feel that it needs, someone needs to be hearing this. 
So it's it's how you you talk in that that and then the J and the P is whether you like to leave things open ended or you like closure and routine. None of them is better than the other, but the church as a whole, I think are they are F. They are feelers. They are like Rosie. If you have heard us banter back and forth, she's a very strong feeler, and I'm a very strong thinker and so I can I can I have to always remember that when I'm working with with Rosie and think okay how, how am I making her feel like I need to be able to to respond appropriately so the whole idea of the personality comes in is is the redeemed so I started to look at okay if you are going to be washing me if I need a power wash what does that look like it's the redeemed what is an ENT, what does a redeemed ENTJ look like? What does a, so if whatever your personality test, if you like those things, what is a redeemed? Because there's always the positives and the negatives and we can be in rebellion. Well, this is the way I am. You have to deal with it. No, actually, you don't have to deal with it. Let me deal with myself so that I am the best. I am the version that heaven intends, that I am the redeemed version. And that's what Christ does, is the redeemed version. So um, coming back to do we need to change, uh, I'm going to read some scriptures. Um, Ephesians 3. Oh, I do have all of these noted, but not, <laughs> but not um, what the, where the scripture is. So we'll find them. So Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, it says, Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has been lavished upon us as the gift of love from our wonderful heavenly Father the Father of our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped into Christ. That's why we celebrate him with all our hearts. And he chose us to be with his from the very beginning, joining us to himself from the foundation of the universe. So he, so you were created before the foundation of the universe. We switch over to Genesis 1.31, and it says, then God say, saw everything he had made, which is you, because you were created before the foundation of the earth. And he said, it was very good. You have been created already, and, you, and he called you very good. This is before you've been in Christ. Psalm 139, it's very familiar, probably to most of us. Uh, 139 verse 13, it says that there uh, you formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside, my intricate outside, and wove them together in my mother's womb. So we're talking, and this is different, this is different than verse 15 where it says you even formed every bone in my body. So the innermost, we're talking about our, the structure of our personalities. Now, if you understand, uh, if you've had kids, you understand that you do not shape your, per you, you do not. I used to think prior to, to raising my child that I could mold him. Like I could shape him the way I wanted him. That is like for the furthest thing from the truth of parenting. You are discovering who they are so that you can train them in the way they are. So train the child in the way they should go and they will, when they're old, they're not be, depart for them. It's talking about training them into their identity of who they are different and apart from you, not shaping, not molding, under, discovering who they are. Are there similarities? Yes. But they're, but parents, can you, do you understand? Do you, do you agree? Right? There's no, there is no change in a the child, their personality. They are the way they are because God has already knit them. Um, in, uh, in, sorry, I'm switching back and forth Bibles because the, as you know, I love the, the passion and it, but it only goes, it only goes from, it's the New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs. So every time I have to, in the Old Testament, I have to go back to my other Bible. Uh, Jeremiah 1, 5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before I formed you, I knew you. And Isaiah 43, one, verse 1 says that, 
But now that says the Lord who created you and he who formed you, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. That it's very specific to who you are. You are created by God, for God, and in God. You are a you are a new creation. I've already said that you're a new creation. So the new creation doesn't stop. You don't become, you become who you are and you are still recognizable as yourself. So this idea of, of death and being transformed, the transformation happens What did you just say? She just sent me a message. Jen said that the TPT is cut. Isaiah? I'm so excited because I'm like even waiting. Sorry, that was, a, that was an ex. Just noticed something. Um, yes, the passion is great. I can only wait till he actually gets into the, into the prophecies, the prophet books. Sorry, coming back to that he, when we're resurrected in Christ, Jesus was still recognizable by his, he is recognizable um, in his resurrected state, even among people who don't know him, because we, because we are designed to know him, that there is a part of us that, like Muslims around the world, are being are being converted at first inter introduction. They know that it is Jesus when he shows up in their dreams, and so uh, Genesis twenty five. Verse 8 says, Abraham died and he was gathered to his people. We're gathered to his people. Uh, Romans 12, 1, or Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we know these people. They know us that, that he is, we don't become different people. We don't become unrecognizable um, people in our new created state. We are still Create, we are still brand new creation, but we are redeemed into the personalities that we have already been given and we're recognizable. Jesus makes it uh, even more clear. He says in Matthew 8, 11, verse 11, says, many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Why would he say that if we wouldn't recognize who they are? The Mount of Transfiguration also proves that we will be rec recognized in our resurrected state. Jesus is recognizable and we will be like him. All right. Holy cow. Okay, we're moving really quick. We're going to like the thing that I thought I was going to take the, the full hour. I'm probably going to take five minutes. Um, it's okay. It's okay. We could, I could talk about this for like, days because I think each one of these points is so poignant that it I mean it is it's a, an area of study that we could delve deeper and deeper and deeper into and I will have some other resources and books um, if you are interested in all of this stuff I love the knowing me knowing God and then also this book is uh, called brilliantly you by Michelle Cuss and it's a new book uh, and she she's a uh, registered psychologist who does the, the MBTI testing. Um, I've actually also been fully tested, um, professionally tested, um, but I recommend, I'm going to post some things so that you can take the free test and see if you, um, and just understand that God loves you for you. So that's your first identity. The second part is the state of remaining the same under varying aspects or conditions. So you are created in God, for God, and by God, so that you are the picture of God in a world that needs God. So we're going to focus on the, you are the picture of God, that you are the same. So what that's saying, that the state of remaining the same under varying circumstances or conditions is that you are the same in every circumstance. So what is that circumstance? What is it that you are? Well, first, you are loved as a, as a daughter. You are a daughter. You have a father. You have and you are a daughter. When I was, and you are loved. There is, there is. I think our our children get it when they're when, especially when they're young. Then when when then they're in teenagers, they have to test it to see if you actually, if you actually love them. And the idea, I love the picture. I've always had this picture of come like children to come be as children to the Lord. And I think about how I was as a child, and I think 
this is how I relate to God, that I know that there's a picture of like uh, of a of a young child following their parent or following the father and, and mimicking them and doing what they are, which is a beautiful picture. That's not my picture, though. The picture that I have is the one that um, going into a shop and and running away or doing what I want because fully, fully confident that my mom would always find me, that no matter what I was doing, she would find me. And I think both pictures are very valid and understanding that, that um, I don't have to, I mean, I do have to follow him, that's, but he is big enough for me that he will direct me, that he will come get me and he will put me on the right path and that he will, he will train me. And I know that my mom actually had to put some, a little bit of fear in me so that I would stop running away because <laughs> I was so confident that I was going to be taken care of. Now, I did have a phenomenal uh, childhood. I was fully loved and not that not everyone has that same experience. And, um, and I'm sorry about that because God, it's given me a picture of God that I, I haven't had to go through that one, that, that some heal that, that healing that some people have to go to. But then what, what I want to impart is that, that, that actually is the way God is. That is the way that God is. And I can, and I can be an example for what that looks like on the earthly. But did my parents do everything right? Absolutely. Of course not. Of course they didn't do that. They got it wrong, but, but I was loved. I never, ever thought that I was not, that I had to even earn it. Um, that, uh, and, and so that was just a beautiful picture of God that they would actually come get me. And my mom, yeah, had to probably say, you know what, <laughs> if, if you run so far, I'm not fast enough and someone might get you. <laughs> I was, she had to, <laughs> she had to teach me that. And, and I think that the Lord, that has actually also taught me that the Lord keeps, keeps us on a short leash. I'm on a very short leash with the Lord and, and that's okay. I have a lot of freedom in my five feet of space on that leash, <laughs> right? Like it's not one of those retractable leashes. Not me, not me. Some people get that. I don't, I, <laughs> I have that thing and that's good. I have lots of freedom to run and move and in that, and I feel confident that the Lord will always be able to pull me back. I'm never so far that I have stepped away because I'm a daughter. You are daughters. You are daughters and that he will come get you. And Jesus actually reveals to us in, when he teaches the disciples to pray, I'm going to talk to you about this. Um, whenever you pray, be sincere. Okay, I'm going to jump down. So that's, uh, chapter six, that's those five. When you pray, now we start talking in verse five. Then, um, but whatever you, wherever you pray, your father, I'm, I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, your father, be alone with him, and your father who sees you will reward you. Um, when you pray, there's no need to repeat empty phrases, praying for those who don't know God. So you don't have to beg. You can be precise. You can, you don't have to, you know, use so many words and hope some of them stick. You, you can, this is, this is the confidence in knowing God and knowing that you're a daughter. My son knows exactly what to ask me or to come to me and ask so that I will say yes. He doesn't even have to beg. He just, he knows the words to use for me. He knows the words to use for Gary, you know, to get what he wants. Um, and then as a parent, sometimes often I'll say yes and, oh yeah, that's okay. Or, or sometimes, right, you have to say, train them up. Nope, that's not who you are. Uh, and that's what God does. But he says, sorry, I'm, I'm moving past that. He says, there, uh, there's no imi need to imitate those kind of words since your father already knows what you need before you ask him. So you pray like this, our father dwelling in the heavenly realms. And then he goes on, this is so, such a familiar passage, but he's actually relating to the disciples already that who their father is. Now, this was such an explosive thing um, to the 
to that day and age, I mean, this is what the, what the real leaders of the day had, that God is your father, that, that, that no, you're not, God is, you can't say that, but he's saying to that he's actually all giving them their identity. It's a, it's a preempt to their identity that, that God is their father, that they are sons, that we are daughters. Jesus uh, says to Nicodemus, when Nicodemus comes to him at night, teacher of the law, who was a leader, and he says, I'm actually going to read it, in John 3. One night he discreetly came to Jesus and says, Master, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one performs the miracle signs you do unless God's power is within him. Jesus answered, Nicodemus, listen to this eternal truth. Before a person can perceive God's kingdom realm, they must experience a rebirth. Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, rebirth? How can a gray-headed man be reborn? It's impossible for a man to go back into the womb a second time and be reborn. But Jesus answered, I speak a eternal truth. Unless you're born of water and spirit, you will never enter God's kingdom realm, for the natural realm can only give birth to natural things, uh, the spiritual realm gives birth to natural things. And so we were reborn, we know this, um, as sons and daughters. Um, and First John, it follows that First John says that his lavish love is what births us into children. So it's his love. Um, and then he is saying that when we're in Christ, we're born. Into, so the spiritual thing is being born by the spirit in Christ in the resurrection of Christ. That's where we get our life, that um, we are forgiven in the death, that, the, 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 that he died um, as the sacrifice, um, but we're actually changed. The cro I know we say that it's at the cross, but it's actually at the resurrection is where we get the identity. Our, our identity doesn't come from the cross. Our identity comes from the resurrection and the life of Christ. And um, I don't want to mix all that up, but he also says, so he says to us, so what is that, that we, Jesus said that if you've seen me, you've seen the father. So I'm going to say something that might be, I want you to think about it. When someone sees you, can they say, I've seen the father? Christ is in you. This should be true of us. This is true of our identity. If they've seen you, they've seen the father. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Who among us is bold enough to say that? Follow me as I follow Christ? Oh, no. We, we want to be falsely humble and say, no, no, it's not me. It's God. No. Christ in you. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus says that I, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Christ in us. We should be able to say that. You've seen me, you've seen the Father, you've experienced the Father's love. God says to Moses that you are as God to them. First, he says that, he says that twice, actually, that you are as God to them. First, you're, you're as God to Aaron, so to, to the ones that you're teaching, and then you are God, as God to, the, to Pharaoh or representing to the world outside. So they may not know God, but they will see you. You are the testimony. You are not just giving a message. You are the message. And so if you don't understand rightly your identity, this becomes a very big burden that we cannot live up under. But because Christ in us, that's how we do it. That's how we can do it. So all of Romans 8, 19 says all of creation is waiting for us to be revealed. But what will happen when the revealing Okay, so when does it, and okay, so when does the revealing happen? Um, this is another huge teaching, which I want to get into at some other point, but when the new, so we're being revealed, um, it's, we've actually been revealed, we are being revealed. As we come into this knowledge, it's not, all of creation waits. There is, I believe, I believe that it's incorrect teaching to say that when Christ comes again, that's when we'll be revealed, because because it, it, all of creation, meaning meaning all of the world will see us, will be put on display as sons of daughters. Well, that's when in, in the next life, 
how we describe it, that's not when it's going to be happening. It's in this life. So when does that happen? It's when the old covenant passed away and the new covenant fully came into effect, which was at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Then there was, then we are not no longer under the law. We are no longer under the old covenant. We are under um, and we have entered into the new covenant and the new covenant gives us the power hour. So we're coming now into the final, the final point is the condition of being oneself and not another. And uh, I'm going to, this book is probably the normal Christianity by Jonathan Welton. We've, we've heard lots of story testimonies, messages, and on the identity of Christ. And I'm going to focus, I will focus on this. I think that this is where we come in and this is where the whole flag collection, the declarations of who we are. Uh, and I want to talk five minutes before we end um, about this. Uh, so that wh who we are in Christ, we are now, when we talk about, so this is really what we talk about when we think about identity. And if most messages are about this, um, but we don't put on the power, we, we become the power. We, we become the power at work. We become, we become the, the it, and it, again, I, I cannot stress, it is never about what we can do. It is about Christ in us. Um, and, but there's, so there's not, there's not arrogance, it's just confidence in who we are. We are not talking about the gospel. We are the gospel. We are the message that we are. Okay, I have a question. Who, who among you are, is sinners? Now keep your hands down. You're not sinners. You're not sinners. <laughs> trick question, trick question. You are saints. And what God has done is that we are actually no longer sinners. We, we are not sinners. To identify as a sinner is to be errant in, in our identity at all. Because um, just because I sinned is, makes, no longer makes me a sinner. It is, I'm not a sinner. Just like barking like a dog makes me a dog. We are, we are fully formed in Christ. Hebrews 5.14 or 10.14 says, by his one sacrifice, we are made perfect forever, those who are becoming. So hashtag becoming. Um, but we are fully these things already, that we are no longer sinners, that we are not sinners, and to identify as a sinner is actually causing us to be double-minded. Coming back to what happens with the, the, being double-minded, we lack our faith, and he cannot and will not reward those without faith. And so who are we all? Oh, man. Okay. Can I go like a little bit longer? Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, so he calls the saints. We're actually Christians, which is the little anointed ones coming into the declaration of we are anointed. We are anointed. When Christ said that I've been anointed to preach good news to the poor, um, to I, I, that scripture I did not write out, um, but you know the one, Isaiah 61. That's what we've been anointed to do. He talks extensively in scripture about the things that we should do. And again, I want to stress that it is not about what we perceive to do. I can, it is part of your DNA. You cannot change the trajectory of your the of the purpose you you cannot change that when it will come out of you you are the message the power to do these things come there is an endowment of faith i get that that there's a gift of faith but by our normal christianity that's why i like that book normal christianity is that purports that we are this message that where we go what we say, our words are powerful. So if Jesus put, or if, yeah, Jesus at the beginning spoke the world into existence because his words are omnipotent, our words being, meaning all powerful, our words being little Christs, little anointed ones, little 
with his with his spirit in us is that our words are potent so that's why i'm actually not i thought that i was going to be talking a lot more about this this is why i'm not going to be talking a lot about it because understanding uh, this is this is the hashtag becoming that we are it's becoming these things I don't have to tell you the things that you can do it's about discovering what you can do you don't have to teach a, a you don't have to teach a little boy uh, to be a boy they are they they are they are generally more rough and tumble than than girls they they you don't have to teach them these things you don't have to teach them to to like girls you i mean if where there where where that's not true a lie's been there's a door has been opened and there's a lie but you don't have to teach them to love because Christ, because that is the picture of god in a world that needs god that they need God. They need us to see that we love, not because we put on love, but because God is love, God in you, you become love, that you are love. So being, being this, this identity of the power hour, it's not about, hey, look at me, what I can do. It's expressing and fully being that identity and not being able to change it. There's, uh, I am an extrovert. There's no way I can act introverted, but I will never be introverted. That is how God made me. There's times when there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. I get that, but you understand what I'm saying? You cannot. You, there's no. There's no part of you that thinks, okay, I'm going to be supernatural, or I'm going to be spiritual, or I'm going to. This idea of compartmentalizing ourselves, we can't. That becomes double-minded, and we become these things that we are anointed, that we are saints, that we are chosen, that we've actually been chosen. And what I love, um, a little side note, a rabbit trail, um, in that when the temple was destroyed, that meant all of the records of the the generation the meticulously kept records of their lineage of their line of the the, the levite priests so the the aaron the aaronic priesthood and the levites they came from from that line that he, that had, was all destroyed so how can we be priests and how can we be chosen how can peter say in first peter 2 9 that says that you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How can we actually say that? Because, because when, when all of this was very explosive things when he was talking to his, the people. So Paul went out to the Gentiles, but Peter was talking to the, the, the Jews of the day. He was talking to the Jewish, and how can he say, you are priesthood? It was such an explosive thing to say because they couldn't actually prove. This was devastating to them that they couldn't prove who would actually be representing God? Because the priest is the one who represents God. So how can this be? If we come in Jesus, Jesus is in us, that he did not come. Jesus is born in the line of Judah, which is praise. I mean, not he's not even a Levite. So how can he be the high priest? But he comes in, in the order of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was without end and without beginning. He just kind of shows up. So that's how we can be the royal priesthood. That's just a little... I would go into that further. That's a little nerdy thing, but that, that is how we are, we're chosen. That's it, the order. The old order has actually passed away and that we come into this thing that, and the purpose of, of royalty is to do the business of the kingdom. So we are priests and we're royal. We're royalty in the kingdom is to do the, the serving the people. The kingdom never serves the the king the, the king serves the kingdom um in it's been warped and it's been perverted in the way that we understand and because of the world system i think i've shared before in bhutan when i went to bhutan they have a king and it's unlike anything that i've ever experienced maybe asia thailand might be like that too when they really revered their king we don't in the western world we don't understand what royalty does really 
uh, it's they're just figureheads and they're they're really characters. They're they're useless. I mean, I mean we're in the states in Canada. Canada is still kind of under England, but it's we just we we watch them, but they don't do anything. But in Bhutan, the king does things for the people. The king is for the people, serving the people, in among the people, and um, he's for a king. He's quite modest, and and what a good king does, and he and he was revered, and so. He, he explained what the king, what it means to be Bhutanese. He explains and showcases their culture. And just like our king does for us, we do for other subjects. We do for the nations that we are discipling. Okay, I'm going to end there because I have something that I want to do. Yeah, we're going to do this. So you can take yourself soft mute and I'm going to, I'm going to pray and I want to do this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to close it off, pray. And we'll, if you're, if you're game, I think we can do this together. Um, there's some vulnerability that, that I feel we're going to do and that doesn't need to be on public. Okay. Are you okay with that? It, so, okay, Father, I thank you for this this moment, and and I, just, I, f I feel just just scratched the surface of what it is that we are, and and that how much you love us, and how much you're pleased with who you've created, and how we're created, and that you don't want to change us, you want to redeem us, and that we are that we are our DNA comes from you, that and the new creation, that we have your DNA, that we. that we can, we cast off any lies. And even now, if you're just watching this and, and not fall, coming, um, you're watching this later, that bring to mind the lies that we've been believing about ourselves, that you're too this or not enough this, or you're too much that, and, or that everything you are is wrong. That is a lie, and we renounce that lie in Jesus' name. So if that, something is coming up, just Bring that to mind, Lord, that you would be exposing that lie and that we say we, we put a stake through it. We put a, the stake of the cross that that actually that's what died at the cross. And that then now we are re resurrected in the truth of who we are, that we have been created beautifully in who in you that our personality was set in place before the creation of the world and when you set you saw all that you had made and you called it good and that we are counted among that that we've been made good because you are pleased that we are created in your image even at the beginning before the foundation before we knew you we were created in your image and so that lie we we break it in jesus name and we release a new revelation of becoming, hashtag becoming, that this would be um, the start of something new, that we are unconditionally loved as daughters and sons, daughters and sons, and that we are on display, that the world needs to see the, a royal priesthood that, that comes before the people to disciple them, to teach them, and to train them. Um, that this is the mandate, this is the job, not just to know you, but to, so that the world would know you. And how can they know you without us becoming the message? That is what we're becoming. So I release that over all people that watch now and later, um, that there is a blessing on this, that there's a blessing on the, on the, on the identity of who you've called us. In your precious name, amen, Jesus. Amen.